Is there anything more badass than like a villain like sunglasses? Would you say like a villain with like a toothpick, cigarette? Like if you see a quick image, a quick, but then you've also I'm seen th- Arnold with cigars, right? Like in his movies. True, well, we've seen good guys with glasses too. True. It's a badass yeah. thing to have the shades because yeah. it's that sense of yeah. mystery. And the feel, whatever it is, the cigar, the shade, whatever it is, it has to complement the pose. Yeah. The, the pose is what differentiates. So if they got like a lean back, like on the Always chair, a lean back. Yep. with the with the glasses and the cigar, it's like okay, this guy's a badass. I was gonna say the chair. Sometimes the chair situation can show who the bad guy is because good guys don't really do the chair thing, but the bad guys. Because they don't got to do anything. You know what I mean? To show you're really yeah. bad, you're in the chair. You can't have proper standing etiquette or sitting etiquette. You have to be like slumped back. You have to show yeah. that you don't care. Because if you don't care yeah. about rules or your posture, then you definitely don't care about the hero. And society's <laughs> exactly. rules. That's the way it works. Yeah, exactly. So on that note. <laughs> Welcome back to Not A Strong Start, a podcast by filmmakers who talk movies, television, and wear shades and get inappropriate on episodes. I'm your host, Dan Q. I am not your host, Ping Pong. <laughs> and I'm my man, Nicolopolis. There you go. <laughs> but, but but I like how we're talking about shades and then George puts on his prescription <laughs> once. When you do that, you automatically the guy in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> See, but so with these glasses, I'm the guy in the chair who's like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he tied badassly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. but, Take your next left. Take your next left. <laughs> exactly. But on this week's episode, we want to do a spotlight on none other than Denzel Washington. Do we think he's pretty good? I don't know. Let's watch this episode. And let's find out. But first, we're going to hit you with the current event. For this one, George actually found a nice little recent event stuff. So I'm going to hand the reins over to George for this current event so he can let us know about this new experience. In Vegas, they're going to be having a full-on John Wick experience. And apparently they're actually working closely with the director and the creative team to put this whole experience and venture together. So you and your friends can go there and you can go into this building and go through situations that John Wick would go through and kind of like try to solve puzzles in certain situations and just go through that that kind of lifestyle per se and ambiance of what a John Wick world would look like and i think they're actually building like the continental itself so you can go through that whole thing what everyone uh needs to know for this if you are anticipating in joining in this event and going uh, to it when it opens besides of course whatever the ticket price is going to come for it uh you have to bring a dog in order to gain entrance to get the full experience of the john wick experience so (laughs) just keep that in mind it's funny that you say that. I was actually waiting for the John Wick 2.0 experience where you're on set, meaning you show up to set, you drink your coffee, you get to sit there for about three hours before you get to make up. <laughs> then you have to wait <laughs> in your trailer for about four hours before they call you on just for your, you know, your your co-actor to be screwing up their lines. That whole experience. So you're on set for about 15 <laughs> hours. And you get paid for eight. <laughs> but that's all right. I think it's going to be pretty cool, man. I mean, it sounds cool, but I have to know exactly what that experience means because they're not going to put you in any situation where you're going to be doing any kind of like fighting or anything like that. Cause there are going to be so many lawsuits, somebody pulling an all, you know, like a muscle or something like that. They're going to keep it very minimal and you're probably just walking through like a museum. So maybe you see some people doing some choreographed fighting of some sort. So it'll still be pretty cool. The last time I visited LA, I went to a themed experience, a temporary theme experience, which is kind of, I think similar to it. And it was the stranger things. Uh, experience that they had in California and that was something where you kind of you get your ticket you go in and then you kind of become part of the story so all of the actors there the scientists and all that stuff they're kind of within story guiding you through because you're there for an experiment and they're kind of guiding you through and then things start going wrong and you're being rushed from like room to room and you got to solve certain puzzles you know, while you have things happening, you have uh, these like screens that it looks like things are coming, but trying to break into the room and you're trying to solve things really quick and having to work together. So I'm assuming it's going to be something similar like that, where it's going to be like you're in the movie, but your part of the movie is probably going to be to assist maybe the assassins yeah. where they're like, 
calling you on comms or through the TV and be like, I need you to do this. You know, I need you to open up this, this door, go to the computer, like do this. That's what I'm assuming it's going to be based off of my previous themed experience that revolved around a uh, media product. So I did a, it same, same experience. You kind of walk through like a uh, haunted house and you see like, each, as you go into each room, it's like different parts of it. And it's sort of like, you know, it was really cool. And then I did a stranger thing ones, but I think it was different than yours. I did one that was in COVID. So you're like in your vehicle. But they had like a whole thing as you're driving through and you see all these different scenes play on stuff. It was pretty cool, man. I liked it. It's like through like a whole parking garage in downtown LA. Here's what I want to do. I want to be the concierge. All right. <laughs> Just the guy at the desk. Trying to make and tips. Then, and then out of nowhere, when when the shit really hits the fan, that's when I come into play. I open mm. up my safe. I get my the guns. glasses come off. Yeah, the you know, and that's off. it. Tie comes off and everything. <laughs> It's like, come on, Mr. Wick, let's do this. <laughs> I feel for, for this, they got to give you at least some kind of like weapon. I mean, I'm not right. saying like real weapons, uh, but an air pistol, right? Hand. Yeah. Or like, you know, laser, where maybe like you have to kind of like a laser tag thing where you have to hit like certain targets, maybe provide like backup, like you're giving John Wick cover fire if it's like the experience that i have they got like the actual actors to pre-record some videos that are playing through the security feed and stuff where they're like talking to you so they'll probably have keanu and you know some of the other characters from it communicating with you hey, have you ever seen like like those big i don't even know if they still make them anymore i just remember being a kid but they had like those giant like uh little gun things and if you shoot it it'll just shoot like a big old puff of air to, to the room. Oh I yeah, like, that'd be kind of cool. So they just hand you those, and you're just shooting at people's faces, and two pays flying off. Those, <laughs> those were great for crop dusting people. Exactly. So just like yeah. walk right by them and just. <laughs> but it wasn't me. I'm over here on the other side. We might got the little gun sticking out behind your back. Hey everyone, let's take a moment to talk about where I've been getting these new Not a Strong Start T-shirts from. Head on over to itsnas.threadless.com, the only place where you can get Not a Strong Start merch. Whether it's our newly designed mascot or just your favorite movie logo now with some Nas flair, you can rep your Nas love on tee, hoodie, mug, rug, and so much more. So get yours today. Just click on that link below and have yourself a strong start and not a strong, have a not a strong start, have a, a start that's strong, but not so strong. You know what to do. All right, guys, let's get into our thoughts on Denzel Washington. So why are we doing a spotlight? Why do you think he's worthy of a spotlight? Jose, we'll start Me. with you. Denzel freaking Washington, all right? Like, first of all, he's he's one of my favorite actors. He has been for a while. He's someone who just never shortchanges you with a performance. You know, there's this, like, sense of, like, cool and, like, charisma that comes with Denzel Washington when he's on screen, regardless of, of his role. And as he's entering now the, you know, well, he is in the twilight of his career, you know, it's Felt like it was good to pay him respect. Plus, with this being February, you know, Black History Month, you know, we want definitely wanted to recognize uh, one of the the top actors that are out there. So that that was why I felt it was time to do a Denzel spotlight. Yeah, and no, I totally agree. I think to to second on that, like, there's definitely a uh, a powerful confidence that he brings to all of his roles. You know, like when he's on the screen, it's commanding. Like, you know, it's just like this force that you have to pay attention to that I've, I've personally always liked. You know, you talk about someone who hasn't, you know, missed a step. He, he's always on point. He never shortchanged you, like you said, Jose. There's some actors like a De Niro where I feel like sometimes he might phone it in just because it's like, I've been this for so long. I'm not going to give you a full on, you know, you'll get a 5% and that's going to be enough. But with Denzel, I feel like he's always giving you that 100. Even though, like, there's a certain cadence and demeanor that's kind of similar to every role it's still a hundred percent and i think there's something there's a lot of merit to put to that and i that's why everything he does i'm gonna watch it i don't care what the hell it is he'd be painting a fence you know no no pun intended for the movie fences guess but it's just like say, he, yeah. he could be doing doing that i'm like he's gonna do something that's gonna make it special <laughs> you know? got oscar nominated yeah <laughs> well, there you go yeah um I, I agree with you guys he has such a quiet powerfulness to his performances and that's something that very few actors have like uh morgan freeman has something like that but his is more of a, a little more of like a matured kind of royalty feel to morgan freeman you know what i mean like even the way yeah. he delivers his lines his cadence is very powerful yeah. uh denzel it's something a little different and the great thing about acting is 
you kind of go through your evolutions where you think, okay, this person is my new favorite actor. And then they'll kind of have like a little bit of a run. And then somebody else will come and be like, okay, the, right now, this is my new favorite actor for a while. Denzel's always been one of those ones that's been consistent. That was definitely a big run where he was like, yes, this dude's like the dude right now. But even now, he still drops movies sometimes where it's like, man, he still reminds you he's still that dude. It just really depends on, you know, he, he tends to take a little more breaks in between movies, which I totally understand. So he's a little more selective. And then it's also the type of movies that he's doing now, right? So it's really just dependent on what era of their film career that you just really appreciated. And spotlighting something like Denzel, going through the movies, you just realize how many decades this guy's been doing this. The guy's been dominating for a very, very long time. I agree. And we're going to get into this later. But, you know, when it was tr I was trying to pick out my personal, like, peak of his career, and that became pretty hard because I'm like, okay, where do I start? Where do I stop? Do I choose this period? Do I choose this period? Because he had multiple periods where then it becomes, you know, very subjective and and personal opinion of what was his peak to you personally. And we'll we'll get into that later. Uh, does anybody have stuff about his background? Kind of knowing this, you can see it in his acting. But he, you know, he comes from a theater background. He started off. Uh, in, in theater in multiple parts of the country. I believe he started in, in San Francisco and then he did theater in like Maryland, you know, on the East Coast. So he's kind of like hopped around, but you can kind of see that in his in his performances and, and sometimes in some of his roles where he's very expressive with his body and his face, the way he interacts. And he only comes from like a, a theater background, you know, because of the way theater is set up and it's like, you know, for the most part, unless you're doing theater in the round, it's very one-dimensional. Then we're looking at one angle. You know, you have to the, communicate with the people in the back and forward. You don't have a lot of the context you get with film itself. So it, it becomes a lot about physical expression and physical projection. You know, the little things in your face and things like that where you have to exaggerate a little bit. Like, not too much, but exaggerate a little bit. To get the same effect. So you see a lot of that sometimes with, with his acting and his role, which makes sense from the theater background. And I believe, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, I think his first movie was Carbon, Carbon Copy. I think yeah, Carbon like Copy, yeah, yeah. His face, uh, first like mainstream one. So that was, he started back in the 80s. So yeah. here we are, you know, for over 40 years later. And he just, he released another movie last year and he's not stopping yet. He, I think he has another couple ones that are queued up. Uh, yeah. going forward yeah i think to tack on to that is going to like his past like there's an intelligence that goes to his his acting and how he portrays a role i think a lot of that goes into also like what he went to college for being in journalism and journalism you're obviously doing a lot of investigation work you know and then you have to write up your piece when you write a piece it has to be dictated in a way for people to understand but also you got to come across almost as you're educating the person on the information that you gained and i always get that from him I get that sense that he's an educator with how he speaks. You know, mm -hmm. you can see he's done a lot of research in anything he's done. I think mm -hmm. that that's a very important part to like what makes him so successful in his career. Yeah. And a great thing about his acting, and like you said, Jose, about the theater acting, is he has little nuances to his acting. So even to go with your point, George, where you say you could tell he's done the research, he adds little character details to the way that he acts within scenes and his movements and things that just bleed more into his character that makes it seem so believable. So it seems like he absolutely has done his research, even to the points of his movements of his acting, which I think is phenomenal. So even take the movie Flight, right? Um, we know when you see that he has like alcohol addiction issues and things like that, and you see little moments or movements of the characters that feel very believable. If you've ever known somebody or you yourself have experienced anything like that, you see the little nuances to his acting that feel so authentic. And I think that's the great thing about this guy is that he's so authentic. It doesn't feel like, oh, here's Denzel again in a different movie, right? Because, you know, there's some great actors that are like that, but some of them just feels like, okay, it's this person playing this character. Denzel really feels like a different character every time I see him in a movie. I believe him. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with that. Even <clears throat> with, uh, you know, there are similar intricacies be between his different roles. I think there's a montage up there of like a certain line that he uses uh, pretty much in every movie. Yeah, it's but in my name. With... <laughs> 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 my no, but there, there, there's some... My man. My man. My 
my man. My man. My man. Good for you. <laughs> my man. <laughs> There's something else I can't remember. It. There's a certain thing that mm -hmm. it's consistent through all his yeah. movies. I guarantee you. I guarantee it. And I can guarantee you. Because I can guarantee you. I guarantee it. I can guarantee you peace of mind. Guarantee it. And I guarantee you. I guarantee it. But I can guarantee you this, Coach. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you you won't be lonely. I can guarantee you peace of mind. I guarantee you. I can guarantee you that. But it, it it doesn't take away from how different those characters uh, mm -hmm. feel, even though it, it's kind of like an artist who has all these different type of paintings, but then they have one thing that's their signature that they yeah. put in everything. Yeah. So it's he has a signature. Yeah, he has a yeah. signature in all the roles, but it doesn't make them all the same. No, and what I like about that is that I don't think it's necessarily something that he intends to do. Like, oh, this is going to be the signature I put in an actual painting. What I love about it, though, is that I feel like it's his natural Denzel coming out. And he just can't stop himself, which then you see that he blurs a line between himself and the character. And I mean that in a very positive way. And I think that's why it comes off as so authentic, is that he really taps into the believability. So if he was this character, if he, like how he was in you know Alonzo in Training Day, if he was this person, well, in order for this person to feel re very real to him, there's going to be moments or parts of his lives that maybe got super exaggerated. Maybe his life went in an entirely different direction, but it helps him get to the mindset of what that character was. And that's why I think sometimes when he does use those lines or whatever, I think it just naturally comes out maybe from a Denzel place. But I think that's what adds to his authenticity. With that being said, he has an extensive career. And I know you have mentioned a couple of movies mm -hmm. uh, they've been in. We've already, I think, mentioned like three total movies between, you know, Fences, Training Day, yeah. and I forget <laughs> what the other one was. But out of that extensive, now 40-plus year career, George, we'll start with you on this one. What is your, in your opinion, your personal peak of his career? Like if I have to pick like the one, yeah, yeah, one, one, Ooh. one feat where he had a a streak of of movies that you were like, yes, if I had to eliminate the rest of his career and just keep this one, uh, I'm I'm good. I mean, I feel like there's an obvious one that most people are gonna say just because it's the the one that really pushed him over, but I don't want to go with it. Is this two on the nose? Whatever you want, yeah. It's your personal. Whatever your personal right. opinion is. Like, what's the time frame and uh, what are some of the movies that includes? All right. Well, it's going to be the training day time frame. It's just because of the, the sense of whenever you have a an actor always is the hero and they make that flip to be the villain, it's usually a knockout of the park. You know, Tom Cruise did it. Uh, Freaking Kevin Costner's done it. And to me, like, those, those are some of, like, their best films just because you don't expect it. And with a movie like Training Day, like, you had around that same time, I think, was, like, John Q. Remember that Titans was a lot earlier? But around that same time, like, he was still busting out a lot of these films where, like, he's just, like, the the guy. He's, like, the, the hero of the story. He's the mentor. And with Training Day, we still get those things. We get the guy who's the mentor. We get the sense that he's the hero of the community. But all of a sudden you find out it's like he's also kind of got a dark side to him. Yeah. And I thought there was something special about that. Like he still harnessed all those attributes of the good guy, but yet somehow still did it in an evil way. And it had us still rooting for him. Like at the end of the movie, I'm pretty sure all of us out there are just like, he's like Tony Montana. I don't want him to die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want him to survive all this. Get rid of Ethan Hawk. We don't need him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to me, there's something very special about that. And like and with all those movies where like these heroes become the bad guy, you know, they have to go away. But like it's I think there's something so special about just holding on to our attention in a way where it's like, I don't I don't want you to go. I, I don't care. I don't care if you did all you killed all these people. I don't care if you're stealing the money and the drugs. You you're doing it for for a right reason. Maybe. <laughs> oh, he's got a reason. Yeah. <laughs> No, and that's true. You you take Denzel out of that movie and that performance out of that movie, I mean, it's it's just there. It's just there. There isn't yeah. nothing special about that movie. What creates the longevity of that movie and the hype and the rewatchability is Denzel Washington and his performance. Everything else there 
it's not anything that you can't get from a bunch of other movies. Well, you know, I don't want to take away from the directing. I think the directing of that movie was still really yeah, well done, too. Well, I mean, like, yeah, yeah like, but I really feel I, I, the I mean, setting. Like, yeah, I mean, like, performance-wise, content-wise, like, story-wise, you know, the, the, the story is nothing, you know, overly nothing special. It's, it's yeah. very, very simple. You know, you get good performances from other people and all that, but what shines is Denzel Washington. I mean, David Ayers wrote that, so I, I still feel like the story, I like the fact that it was simple because that's what David Ayers does. That's when he's at his best, right? Giving us a simple story, but with complicated characters. I just thought Denzel completely saw the vision that Antoine had for this and just completely took it to that element. So I agree. Going to his peak, um, I say, same era, like to me, that's just, that's his peak. So I start off with the Bone Collector 99, the Hurricane in 99, Remember the Titans in 2000, Training Day in 2001, John Q in 2002, and then even to finish off, Antoine Fisher, which was his directorial debut. So Denzel had a nice run, man, and even starting to get, and this is when he first started dabbling with directing right at the very end of that. So I'm not, it's not for me to say that this run was just his best movies. That's the great thing about Denzel is that it was spread out, but this run is what pushed him over the limit. I remember when The Bone Collector came out, it really started, it started putting him on that, you know, in front of our face. Now, we know he did Philadelphia. And he crushed it, but this one started putting him more into like leading man contender. When we started seeing like the hurricane, remember the Titans, that's when really it's like, okay, this guy's your leading man. Like it solidified it. Yeah. And I agree. It seems like we're we're kind of on the same page with this. With a 40 year plus career, uh, my time frame was a little more expanded. I kind of went with a nine year time frame. So like 25% of his of his career. <laughs> but I started like I went 95 to 2004 at time frame which is a long time, but in the context of how long his career is, it isn't. Uh, it was starting with Crimson Tide, Courage Under Fire, Fallen, then going into the one Stan mentioned, the Bone Collector, all the way through. And then I added at the end cap, Man on Fire, after Antoine Fisher. But you had all those movies within, what is that? That's 10, 11 movies within a nine-year period that he had and they were all they were all good it's not just about them being good because he had other movies that were really good outside of this period you mentioned you know philadelphia but it was variety in this nine-year period you know you had action you had thrillers you had drama you had you know with fallen sort of a horror more towards thriller but sort of a horror there with some of those elements so he was hitting multiple genres within this short time frame. And that's why, to me, I feel like it's the peak because it showed the highest level of versatility when it came to what he can do on screen. What are some of his highest accolades? So we know he's a two-time Oscar winner, right? So, uh, Jose, you want to tell us a little bit about those? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we've already mentioned Training Day uh, for, you know, leading role. Uh, he got that one, which I remember a lot of people have made comments because they're like, oh, he had to turn into a bad guy to get like the recognition and get the <laughs> award. Uh, but then before that, he also had a, a, a best supporting for glory. And that was earlier in his career. It's a shame that I don't know if you guys agree with me that he only has two. I feel he has so many great performances. He yeah. should have more than two under his belt. I agree. But, What's one that you think he should have won for? Let's start off with that. With George, we'll start off with you. Man. I mean, it's one of those things, like, we mentioned Philadelphia. He definitely should have got it for that, honestly. I mean, Malcolm X was a big one that he should have got he it for. At least, I don't think he even got a nomination for Philadelphia. Like, uh, never yeah, mind I'm, winning. I'm not so sure if he did either. I don't think he got yeah. an Oscar nomination. Yeah. And that's the thing. Even just getting recognized is enough, they say. It's like, he's one of those actors where, like, every dramatic role he does probably should get at least nominated, you know, let alone probably a win. I don't know why they feel like that with certain actors where it's like, well, we don't want to oversaturate them by always nominating them, but they have no problem doing that with Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep? <laughs> like, they, they just don't yeah, care. Right? Like, well, well, Meryl Streep earns and, and, it. And that Meryl means Lewis phenom- got it for every movie. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, she's phenomenal. Don't get me I'm not knocking her at all. But, like, some of these actors, like, it's like the Denzel. Like, man, you could really nominate this guy as well. Like, why why her and not the male actors? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Weird. Yeah, it's, it's a yeah. weird thing. Yeah. But and, anyways, yeah. Uh, Jose, what, what about you? I, I think one that he should have won, especially considering who won that year, um, I think he should have won for Fences because 
I think his performance was better than Casey Affleck's performance in Manchester by the Sea. Oh yeah. Like there was this uh, yeah, so I I think looking at who actually won, I feel he should have won for Fences. That would have been a great opportunity to get an Oscar as a non bad guy. That's true. I went with John Q. He gives such a masterful performance in John Q. I love that movie based off of him. I mean, he takes a hospital hostage, for God's sakes, <laughs> when the insurance company won't do the surgery for his son's heart transplant. Like, dude, just the, the, the synopsis, the quick story is already like, man, that's fascinating. You know, you have this good guy, this hero that goes to great measures and lengths just for the betterment of his son, right? Putting himself at risk of everything. There's so much to that, and he just does such a masterful job with it, man. He carries the entire movie. And hostage movies, there was a nice era in the 70s, right? Like Dog Day Afternoon, where they did it yeah. so well. That's and the then first it, thing I thought of when you mentioned yeah, John Q, too. Exactly. <laughs> so then w when you hear that, um, it, then it kind of felt like they oversaturated a little bit, and he started getting like some that were just like, ah, okay, they're overusing it now. But then John Q did it, and I was like, man, that's so good. Like when you hear it from that point of view, and when you have like a hero's journey that's going to prime. Uh, going the crime route to get what they need because they're completely out of options. So good, so good. It's funny because he's been on both parts of the end uh, of the end of it in the in the movie. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there him being the perpetrator, and then you also had like Inside Man, where he was on the outside talking with the person inside that was the perpetrator. So he's mm -hmm. he's done it on both sides of it. Yeah, um, he's a one man operation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good segue into the, the next question that we have here because I kind of wanted to see what's everyone's personal favorite like a movie. Doesn't have to be the best movie, but like favorite and then the same thing, favorite performance. Doesn't have to be his best performance, but you know, which is what. Uh for performance, I had to not go with the obvious training thing. I had John Q as my choice. Uh, for his performance there, so it's it's good that you mentioned that movie. He did really well, really believable as the father willing to do anything for his child, regardless of the consequences after, you know, as long as they take care of his boy. So that was really good performance on his end. And then for movies, it's, they're not his best movies, but they're the ones that I can keep going back to and rewatching. And it's the Equalizer movies. Uh, he's so good in that role. They're entertaining. They're good action movies. All three of them have been good. Even the latest one that came out uh, was good. So if I had to pick, like, uh, yes, it's a little mini franchise. So there's three movies technically, but I'll, I'll take the Equalizer movies. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you, George? What's, <laughs> That's uh... a long way to get to the Equalizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's impressive with the Equalizer, too, it's like, I want to say it's his first, like, sequel series. Yeah. So, yeah right yeah and he's he knocked it out of the park yeah. not many actors can say they've been a part of a sequel series and it's still good all through all three films yeah mm -hmm. so that, i think that adds to the accolades that he deserves it's mm -hmm. like this is why he's one of the best mm -hmm. he, he does what most can't do but uh for me i'd say uh performance wise I'm, I'm gonna go with this is later on in his career, but American Gangster, I thought he gave a really good performance. Kind of dips his toe and get back again into that that bad guy side of things. But like I watched that movie, and I don't see a bad guy. You know, I, I see a god. It's a Godfather movie. You know, this is a guy who's just taking care of his family. You know, that's that's what I see through the whole thing, and I, I really enjoy it. And it's the reuniting of him and Russell Crowe. You know, for first doing uh, was it Virtuosity, which is an underrated movie in my opinion. I think Virtuosity is a really fun movie to watch. That's probably the one I would go to as my fun movie, honestly. Like, this is the movie I watch for, like, really good acting as American Gangster. But for a good time, I watch First of Virtuosity. Because it's like, they flip the roles, you know. And that one, Denzel's the cop going after the bad guy, which is Russell Crowe. And then in American Gangster, Russell Crowe's the cop going after the bad guy, which is Denzel. I think it's a nice little duo to pair together. For a fun time. Welcome to Virtuosity. <laughs> <laughs> good, what about um, you, Dan? Yeah, I... I... I still feel like his best is training day, even though like, but I'm not going to go into that just because we've talked about it, you know, already at length, but his portrayal of the villain is just one of my favorites that I've seen on screen. I think he's just so phenomenally nuanced in that role. The things that he pulls from it, it's his eye acting. He does so much acting with his eyes in that movie that I just think it's masterful the way he does it. When we get movies like John Q that he's just so phenomenally vulnerable, he still does that. 
But the difference with Training Day was that there was layers to it. You saw the layers of him justifying a lot of his dark actions for trying to find excuses on why he's doing it. That's what I think is so unique about that role. But I'm going to give some love to the movie Flight. I thought he was great in Flight. Uh, the movie itself was you know, pretty good. It's one I've gone back to maybe a couple times, like two, three times. But he's so good in that. And when you introduce John Goodman, man, they had great chemistry together. John Goodman was phenomenal in that movie. And when you see the whole um, scene where they had to rush Denzel to the court, you know, and they're giving him all this <laughs> to like hype him up and give him all this energy. He just kills it. Denzel just kills that role. And the movie itself was good, but he makes it just so much deeper. So I feel like there's so many things we could have chosen. And it's just a, mm -hmm. you can't go wrong. Really. Yeah. Mm -mm. I'll say one of the things I, I was debating picking and putting on my list was uh, much ado about nothing and his his run at Macbeth because mm -hmm. of the fact that like uh, there's plenty of actors who try to dip their toe into Shakespeare and it doesn't always go so well you know it's like okay you don't you don't belong in this and it's, that's not easy Shakespeare's not an easy thing to take on you know there's very few actors who can do it and it sounds natural and it sounds right I think he's one of the few actors where it actually feels right for him to do it because like I said before he has a cadence to how he talks there's a certain rhythm to how he speaks that's perfect mm -hmm for Shakespeare you know it's like when I watch that him do it it's like yeah background yeah background. yeah <laughs> you know like there's just that you know that da -dun, da -dun, da -dun kind of thing yeah. and I feel that when he talks like he has that kind of thing so let's get into uh, some fun facts what are some of the Denzel Washington fun facts that you guys found uh one that I have here which would have really changed changed the movie overall is that uh he actually turned down Brad Pitt's role for the movie Seven. Mm -hmm. He thought it was too demonic. Uh, but then he saw the movie afterwards, and he was just like, I've made a big mistake. Uh, <laughs> he definitely regretted not, not doing the movie. I think not too long after, he did Fallen. Did I say he did Fallen, though? <laughs> which I, I, I think was just kind of like his thing, uh, like, damn, I missed out on Seven. Like, maybe this will be my Seven. Uh, but that's it's a fun fact that who knows how it would have uh, shifted his career at that moment, uh, how it would have shifted Brad Pitt's career, because that's one of his big movies yeah. in his career. I mean, I'm sure they would have both still been fine, but there could have been some differences in there just off of that role. That would have been interesting because Brad Pitt brings like this sense of unsurety, you know, uncertainty, I should say, to the character. You know, like he never feels like he really 100% gets what's going on mm -hmm. not like freeman's character where like he's he's learning you see he's picking up things but like there's like this uh naiveness to pitt's character that i i would have been interested in seeing how denzel would have taken it because mm -hmm. you mentioned like there's a confidence to denzel yeah. and how he portrays a role so it's like would it just been like these two big guys butting heads <laughs> you know but if i'm not mistaken i think they had if it, he would have done it didn't yeah. they have somebody else in morgan someone then? else i yeah. forget who they were but someone yeah. else was uh up for for the other role and i think once he turned it down they got brad pitt they went with morgan freeman uh, yeah so yeah. i don't think yeah <laughs> but anyway, they just that. picture him there like man what's in the box yeah 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 <laughs> okay uh george you want to go next i think he had mentioned like he want he may have been like a lawyer okay. if he hadn't done acting which is yeah. funny since he's played a lawyer like yeah a dozen times yeah, makes sense. <laughs> that's funny that's funny because he also it's he wanted to be a doctor and then one of his first roles was yeah, like uh, elsewhere was a yeah. yeah so this is one that i had tarantino had did an uncredited rewrite of the script of crimson peak and when he was on set during filming denzel just went off on him in front of everyone about his use of racial slurs and all that in, in Tarantino's movies. And Tarantino got super uncomfortable and was like, can we go to a private area? And Denzel said, no. If you want to put this out to everybody, we can have a conversation right here in front of everyone. It's like, whoa. Ooh. That was damn. interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> damn. All right. But like, I'm, props to Denzel, man. It's tight. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. See, that's interesting that he, saying that because I saw an interview with him. It was on like a a UK thing. I think his name was like Jonathan or something or whatever. I can't remember the guy's full name, but uh, he was interviewing Tarantino and Denzel. And there's like mm. kind of a waiting room thing, you know, like all these talk mm. shows, but over in the UK, they kind of usually will show the waiting room of the people that are guests. So he's mm. talking to like Denzel. He's like, well, how come you haven't been in any of Tarantino's movies yet? Like, has he just not like 
requested you and you can immediately see on Denzel's face like that look of like maybe I don't want to do it you know like there's something against Tarantino but he plays it off he's just like I don't know you know he's just never asked me to do any of his things so then he he calls over Tarantino in the room he's like so what's going on Tarantino and he's like hey you know I'll have him on whenever he wants <laughs> it's like you just gotta give me the word it's like I'll have to write something up don't yell at me yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But it's that kind of thing. And Denzel is such a respectable person. But yeah, I, I saw later, you know, in that same uh, article, they said that he got interviewed and said, oh, what are your thoughts on Tarantino? He's like, oh, he's good. Or or he said something like that. It's kind of like a glossy compliment where it's like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> it would have been interesting to see him in the Tarantino movie, but right, we we'll probably be, never get it. He'd be great, but I just don't. Yeah, with one more movie left, I don't see it. Which, on a weird note, did, did you hear that they Tom Hanks or what is it? Tom, Tom Cruise? Cruise might be in it. Yeah. I'm like, hell yeah, man, yeah, please, that'd be awesome. Yes, I think they have some fun together. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. All right, Jose, what's your next one? I know we've touched a lot on Training Day, but my next one fact <laughs> actually has to do with Training Day, and just shows how like in tune he was with this with this character. Uh, King Kong ain't got shit on me line uh, was ad-libbed. It was not in the script. In the moment, he was just like, this feels right. My character would say this. And he chose King Kong because that was one of the first movies he saw as a kid. So it, it popped in his mind, like King Kong, this big, like intimidating, like figure. And he was like, my character feels like they're above it all and no one can mess with them. So he was just like, King Kong ain't got shit on me. And they were like, that works. Keep it. We're keeping it. <laughs> Here's the next one that I have is, uh, this was about the movie Philadelphia. Tom Hanks was one of those actors that was regarded as the best actor, right? For like a period of time yeah. as well. So this was right in Tom Hanks, like just beginning around his peak era. You know, when they did De uh, Philadelphia and Denzel was more on the newer end, kind of, you know, breaking in. And Tom Hanks is praised working with Denzel Washington. He said it was like going to film school. And he learned more about acting from Denzel in that movie than anybody else he's ever worked with. That's one of the highest compliments coming from when Tom Hanks was at his peak and Denzel was still new coming in. But that just tells you the great actor that he's always been. Right. Like it's a thing he's been training for a long time. And when you get theater actors that do film, movies, feature films, it doesn't always translate, right? So sometimes you can kind of tell when the theater actors, but with this one, Denzel is just so, it completely made him for what he does. And that's why I think he's so great on film. On that note then, let's see what's on the queue. What's a Denzel movie that you want to recommend to our listeners? Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention one that we haven't talked about yet. It's not, we went to the list, it's like top movies, it's not going to be up there, but it was good and underrated unstoppable with uh with chris pine it's actually a, a good little action thriller it isn't that long doesn't overstay it's welcome uh so it feels like a good movie if you just want to sit back and be entertained and see a good denzel performance on a train yeah I think that's one of tony scott's last films too right i think so yeah. yeah uh for me i'm gonna have to go with this is the first movie i've ever liked by uh spike lee and that was inside man we did kind of mention it earlier but it's uh, it's Denzel and Spike Lee coming back together again. They did quite a few films together. It's all were successful. But this one, I think, was a, a pivot point for me with, with Spike Lee, where like he was doing something a little bit more blockbustery mainstream, but still felt independent in some ways. I, I, I love that movie so much. It's such a good movie from both Denzel and Clive Owen. And, and there's some nice little twists in, along the way. I, What's awesome? I remember watching that, and then at the end of it, I was like, Holy crap, that's a great plan. Yeah. Like, sometimes you watch these <laughs> yeah. movies and you're like, and it inspires nah. you to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that I one, I was like, okay. that could work. Yeah. Well, maybe we better start watching whoever yeah. wrote this script. Yeah. <laughs> that long game. Yeah. Yeah. On a side note, though, it was great that Spike Lee then worked with the son, right? For a Black Klansman. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal movie. Love that movie. One I'm going to recommend, remember the Titans, you know? We got to sit yeah. there, see him being a, a, a football coach to the kids. That's a movie that's really good. It's really fun to watch. A lot of memorable lines in it, but he just gives a great performance. You know, like the hoorah gets them excited and ready to go. So, you know, football season being over, there's a football movie you can watch in the off season. Yeah. What's good about that movie is that the focus on Denzel uh, Washington's character is not as big as 
it seems, but he is such a presence that people remember so much of him. But his, the focus on his character is not to that level mm -hmm. that he's remembered for, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's true. On that note, we hope you enjoyed the spotlight of Denzel Washington. You can look on our channel and find all the other spotlights we've done for other artists. But thank you for watching another episode of Not A Strong Start. You can like, comment, subscribe, share on our YouTube channel, Not A Strong Start. You can listen to us anywhere you listen to your podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter, Not A Strong Start. I'm your host, Dan Q. You can follow me at King underscore Songre. I'm not your host, King Kong. And you can find me at This Is Me Nombre on Instagram. And I'm your other guy, my man. And you can find me at Nicolopolis. Okay.